There is a deadly trend in high-rise fires. The number of burning floors in high-rise buildings double each decade. In the 1970s, New York City experienced a two-floor fire in a high-rise building. In the 1980s, Los Angeles suffered a five-floor fire. And in the 1990s, Philadelphia suffered a nine-floor high-rise fire. What can we expect in the 21st century? The fire service learned some hard lessons at these three high-rise fires. The most important lesson learned is we must improve our strategy and tactics. Another lesson learned is we cannot count on building construction to stop fire spread. Flames spread from floor to floor in these so-called fire-resistant buildings. This video will show new strategy and tactics learned from these three high-rise fires. It will show how to assume command, locating a fire, safe use of an elevator, how to divide stairs between fire attack and evacuation of people, when to vent and when not to vent, and most important, this video will show you how to save lives. Let's start by defining a high-rise building. A high-rise can be defined as a building with floors above the reach of your tallest ladder. If your tallest ladder is a 35-foot portable ladder, a high-rise may be a 40-foot high building. However, in most fire departments, a high-rise means a building more than 75 feet tall. Two important strategies are taken from the fire chief. First, rescues by ladders become impossible. The second strategy taken away by a high-rise is the ability to use outside master streams to extinguish the fire. We must extinguish a high-rise fire using handheld hose streams advanced by firefighters under punishing conditions from inside the smoke and heat-filled building. If we fail, there is no alternative. An outside attack using an aerial master stream is not an option. To locate a fire in a high-rise building, the first arriving officer enters the lobby, proceeds to the security desk, and contacts the person in charge. Identify the exact floor of the reported fire, smoke condition, or sprinkler discharge. If the building has an alarm panel or video display terminal, check the floor numbers shown on the screen and compare it with the floor number given by the person in charge. Sometimes these numbers don't match up. This can happen when a person on an upper floor looks out her window and thinks she sees smoke coming from the 15th floor, but this smoke may have been rising from the floors below. This discrepancy will be discovered by cross-checking these two sources of information. When a panel reveals alarms on several floors, assume the lowest floor to be the floor of fire origin. Begin your search from this floor. Using an elevator during a high-rise fire is extremely dangerous, even one set on fireman service. Use caution. A malfunctioning elevator can bring you up to a raging fire floor. Worse yet, it could take you above the fire. It could also stall, trapping you in an elevator shaftway that becomes a smoke chimney. If an elevator also has a Phase 2 fireman service, use this elevator to reach a location two or three floors below the fire. Never take an elevator to a fire floor. Firefighters using an elevator should prepare for the worst. 1. Be equipped with masks. 2. Have a portable radio to call for help. 3. Carry forcible entry tools for escape from the stuck elevator car. 4. Know the location of stairs in relation to the elevator. You may have to run through smoke to find the exit. 5. Stop the elevator during the ascent to ensure the controls are operating properly. 6. Never take an elevator down to locate a cellar fire. Before the fire attack begins, stairs must be designated for firefighting use. One stair is used to attack the fire, and one stair is used to evacuate people from the fire. Generally, the one with the standpipe outlet will be the stair used to attack the fire. Public address announcements should be ordered by the chief in charge to notify occupants of the identifying letter of the stair they should use to escape the fire. You cannot evacuate all the people from a high-rise building. It would take too much time and too many firefighters. 
At a high-rise fire, we fight the fire while most of the people remain inside the building. This is called a defend-in-place strategy. Fight the fire and evacuate only people in the vicinity of the fire from the fire floor and the floor above. It is best not to vent during an uncontrolled high-rise office building fire. After the fire has been extinguished, then you can vent. Now you can use the positive pressure of fans and natural stack effect air movement to ventilate residual smoke. Once a fire has been located, the most important firefighting action is to get the first attack hose team up to the fire floor and extinguish the blaze. 95% of all high-rise fires are extinguished by this first attack hose team. Getting the wet stuff on the red stuff is the goal. It may be a high-rise building, but it will still boil down to a room and fire on the upper floors. And if you extinguish this fire, your problems will be over. To do this, assemble a hose attack team of one supervisor and four firefighters. Send them up to fight the fire. It requires a minimum of four firefighters to safely bring up four lengths of hose, nozzle, fittings, and then to stretch the 200 feet of hose from the standpipe outlet to a fire on the large floor area usually found in a modern high-rise building. Use a solid stream nozzle at a high-rise office building fire. Window venting required for safe use of a fog nozzle is not an option. When more firefighters become available, send them up in teams of two to perform search and rescue on the fire floor. This search and rescue mission is designed to evacuate people from the fire area, or, if it is safe, to order them to remain in place. Send up a second hose team to back up the first attack team. They stretch a second hose to reinforce the first team, or go to the floor above to extinguish any vertical fire spread. There are five strategies successfully used at high-rise fires. Number one is a direct frontal attack by the first attack hose team. Number two is a flanking attack. Three, an interior defensive attack. Four, a non-attack. And five, an exterior defensive attack. A direct head-on frontal attack by firefighters with an attack hose line is most often used. It is the most successful attack strategy in all high-rise fires. Firefighters launch a frontal attack on a fire by crawling down a hallway, directing a hose stream straight into the flames. They come face to face with the fire and extinguish it. 95% of high-rise fires are extinguished by this frontal attack strategy. A flanking attack is the second most often used firefighting strategy. A hose team advances a second hose line toward a fire from a right angle or from the opposite side of the fire. The flanking, or so-called pincer attack, is used when a frontal attack fails. At some high-rise fires, wind or obstructions prevent the frontal attack advance on the fire by firefighters, and it is necessary to advance on the fire from another direction. The second hose team usually advances from another angle. The interior defensive attack is the fallback strategy when the frontal attack and the flanking attack fail. This strategy calls for one or two hose streams to be operated by firefighters from the protection of a fire-resistive stairway enclosure. A non-attack strategy is used by firefighters at a stairway in a high-rise building when the fire is raging beyond the control of the firefighters and when opening the door leading to the fire would allow smoke, heat and flame to sweep up the stairs and trap people coming down the stairs. In this extremely rare situation, there should be no fire attack. If possible, another stairway should be used to attack the fire, or the firefighters should wait and attack the fire only after all people descending the stairs are safely below the fire and the stairway above has been cleared. An exterior defensive attack using an aerial ladder master stream can extinguish a fire on the lower floors of a high-rise building. 
An outside aerial stream can be used effectively up to the first ten stories of a high-rise. Also, a properly positioned 100-foot aerial or tower ladder with a stream reach of 100 feet can reach the 15th floor of a high-rise building and extinguish fire in an outer room or halt the upward extension of flame from window to window. Sector commands must be established at high-rise fires because firefighters work at distant locations on the upper floors of these large buildings. Firefighters operate out of sight and sometimes out of radio contact with the incident commander down in a lobby command post or street. The incident commander, first to arrive, sets up a command post in the lobby or in front of the building. He assigns sector commanders. First, a sector command must be assigned to supervise the firefighting operations. This operations sector commander is located close to the fire. He supervises firefighting and searches from the floor below or from the fire floor. A rapid intervention team is assigned to the operations officer location. Second, a search and rescue sector must next be assigned to coordinate safe removal or the safety of people ordered to remain above a high-rise fire during the defend-in-place firefighting operations. Third, in addition to apparatus staging outside in the street, a personnel and equipment staging sector command must be established on an upper floor inside the building, close to the firefighting. Usually located two or three floors below the operations post, all reinforcement firefighters and spare equipment, such as masks, hose, first aid equipment, and a rehabilitation unit, are sent up to this staging area. The most common avenue of fire spread in a high-rise building is from window to window. Sometimes called auto-exposure, flames lap out a window and flow upward. Heat cracks or melts the window directly above, then spreads into the floor above, through the broken window. Skeleton steel construction in modern high-rise office buildings sometimes has an exterior curtain wall enclosing the structure. This so-called curtain wall extends over the entire face of the building and is attached by bolts to the outer edge of the floor slabs on each level of the structure. There is a small space between the outer edge of the floor slab and the inside of the curtain wall. Flames and smoke spread to the floors above through this curtain wall space. This space must be checked for fire spread. Shafts and utility closets containing electric power, communication cable, and water pipes are another area of vertical fire spread in a high-rise building. Floor construction consists of several inches of poured concrete on top of corrugated steel sheets. At a serious high-rise blaze, if fire burns uncontrolled for a long time, flames can burn through this concrete floor. There are also unprotected open stairways in some high-rise buildings. Some modern building codes allow these fire spread nightmares called access stairs, or in residence buildings, duplex apartments. When searching a floor above a fire and you encounter large amounts of smoke and heat, consider the possibility of one of these open stairs allowing the fire spread. It took six hours to extinguish two floors in the New York City high-rise fire, and eight hours for the Los Angeles five floors of fire, and it took 16 hours to extinguish the Philadelphia Meridian Plaza Inferno. Realize that if you don't control the fire in the first 30 or 40 minutes by the first attack host team, the next six or 12 hours may be spent inside the burning high-rise building trying to save lives. High-rise firefighting is the fire service challenge of the 21st century. Fire officers need a plan, and this video can be used as a fire strategy action guide. Good luck.